Good morning, everybody. So I see this plenary as a kind of celebration of what we've achieved. And before Johnny sits down, I wanted to just thank him because so much of what we've achieved is, is due to him. We had a trainer's retreat earlier this week and uh, some of the trainers were reminiscing about the old days before the pre-John days when I was much more involved with the administration and, <laughs> and what a relief it is to have somebody who brought such professionalism and consistency and equity and uh, so uh, part of why this is so well run is because of John and the people he's brought in. It's also a great pleasure for me to introduce another person who's made a huge contribution. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago I first encountered Frank Anderson, who I think called me and said, I want to meet with you. and uh, I'd heard of his, his reputation before in the trauma community in particular, and so I was excited to meet with them, but even more excited when he said, you know, I love IFS and I want to devote my life to it, and I hear that from people now and then, but, you know, you, you think, oh, okay, great, but <laughs> Frank, Frank meant it and has done that, and on top of a 40-client-a-week practice and being the primary breadwinner for a family of four. He devotes enormous numbers of volunteer hours to all kinds of things to promote IFS and to um, also be in charge of this foundation. I'm going to read his bio real quick, but that's the main thing I wanted to say about Frank and how grateful I am to him for that. So he's the chair of our fo the Foundation for Self-Leadership and is a co-trainer of the Level 2 Intensive co-trainer with me, uh, IFS Trauma and Neuroscience. He's a psychiatrist who completed his residency and worked as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and has a long-standing affiliation with the Trauma Center in Brookline with whom we're collaborating uh, to, and Frank will tell you about the study we're doing with them. Wrote a chapter titled, Who's Ta Taking What? Connecting Neuroscience, Pharmacology, and Internal Family Systems for trauma in the New Dimensions book. And uh, yeah, so let me introduce Frank, who's going to introduce a bunch of others and announce a bunch of uh, exciting developments, some of which have direct application for your practice. So please help me welcome Frank Anderson. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I love being here, um, I love helping this community. Um, two years ago, the foundation started, and we were charged with this mission to help advance IFS research, to validate the model, and to help bring IFS to the world. And I can tell you within the last two years, we've done an enormous amount of work towards that effort, which I'm thrilled and excited about. And we'll have sharing with you a little bit more about that today. Um, I did a um, workshop with some friends and colleagues yesterday. And one of the pieces we did was collaborate or coordinate Dan Siegel's interpersonal neurobiology with Dick Schwartz's IFS model. And Dan has this term he calls MUI, the me and the we put together. And he coins it as MUI. And I love that. And I kind of feel like that's what the foundation is becoming. It's becoming a MUI. And I wanted to share with you some of the people that have made that MUI possible. People are looking at me a little crazy. Everyone say MUI. <laughs> Got it. There you go. <laughs> First, I'd like to introduce some of our volunteers, which is this ever-expanding list of people who are giving their time also to help this effort. 
Um, and also the folks that were involved in the Pixar pre-screening. We, we collaborated with in, um, IFS New England and had a lot of fun um, putting together that pre-screening event, so I just wanted to thank all of those folks. I also like to let you all know, and I'm thrilled about this, that we actually have a staff now. Michelle Bruce, Mary Mitrovich, and Casita Wild, who are helping the foundation. And also um, our board, uh, most of you probably already know um, Nancy Shattuck, who's a member of our board, um, Mark Milton, who's a member of our board, Harley Goldberg, and Tofiq Hakim. We also have a new board member, and Les is going to help us really bring the board and the foundation to the next level. So I'm really excited and thrilled to have him as a member of our team, our ever-expanding team. Um, just very briefly, just want to mention some things that are happening in the IFS research world now. Um, the annotation project that's been in the works for years is now complete with um, thank you to Jen Matheson and her team, and that'll be up on the website. So it's a collection and vetted um, all IFS articles. So anybody who wants to do any research and wants to do an IFS search will be able to, in one place, see all of the articles that have been published for research relevance. So that's a huge accomplishment for our group. You'll be hearing f about the IFS um, PTSD study shortly, and then the inherent scale, which is up and running and will be used for the first time in the IFS study. So there's a lot of research advancements. I'd like to invite Dick Schwartz up to the stage right now, John Schwartz, Nancy Shattuck, Tufik Hakim, and Nancy Sowell up to the stage. Because within the last two weeks, we got some exciting, hot off the press news, and I would like for Nancy Sowell to share that news with you all right now. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Nancy Sowell. I'm an IFS trainer and psychotherapist. And in 2013, Nancy Shattuck invited me to work with her on a research project, which I think most of you know about at this point, with her rheumatoid arthritis patients. She's a rheumatologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So I went to the hospital to work with her and her team to start an IFS program, which would be used as an intervention, and it would be measured so we could actually see the effectiveness. And that was a remarkable experience for me. And I couldn't do all the groups and the individual sessions myself, and there are um, many IFS therapists that helped with some of the individual sessions that I want to name. So if you're here, please stand up. They include um, Fernando Augusto, um, Fran Booth, um, Amy Friedman, Suzanne Hoffman, Shelley Hartz, Rena Dubin, Paul Neustadt, Patricia Rogers, Martha Sweezy, Joan Atkinson, and Deborah Block. Let's just give them a hand, please. So that research paper was published in 2013 in the uh, Journal of Rheumatology. And, um, and in 2014, the Center for Self-Leadership, in collaboration with the foundation, um, decided to submit an application to SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, which was then accepted for review on the first go-round, which you know, was quite remarkable. And I want to highlight the role of um, Tufik Hakim in that, because he did all of that you know, incredible paperwork. So it's my pleasure, it's truly my deepest pleasure to announce to you that IFS has been selected to be included on the list of, IF of evidence-based programs and practices. <laughs> Uh, 
So I, I have to read you this stuff that's a little bit boring because it's been, it's sort of, you know, on the wave of that. I mean, this is really remarkable. This was our dream and, and actually it was shocking that it came so quickly. We expected to have to jump through many, many more hoops. But I think, um, I think because of how well it was done, thanks to Nancy Shattuck and the research team at Brigham and Women's, um, I, I think we made it through without going, you know, without going through a whole lot of rigmarole. It was really amazing. So here's what they said. They determined that the intervention showed promising results in three outcome areas of phobia, panic, and general anxiety disorders and symptoms. The second one is physical health conditions and sy symptoms. And the third is personal resilience and self-concept. So thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to give you that news. I've, I've, been waiting, I've been waiting for the day when IFS clinicians no longer have to write in code about what they're doing on their clinical notes. And here it is. Okay, as if that wasn't enough, we're uh, thrilled um, to have a preliminary update on the IFS trauma pilot study, which is almost, which is close to being finished. Um, but we couldn't wait to share some of the news with you. So I've asked Hillary Hodgins uh, to come up and give us some preliminary results. She's the PI of the, team, of the trauma study. And I wanted to also acknowledge once again the number of people who have gone above and beyond to help the foundation's effort and cause to advance research. Hillary Hodgins, who's the PI. <laughs> Wendy Rubrick, who's the project manager extraordinaire. Elizabeth Sothwell, Jackie Kikuchi, the team of uh, supervisors, which include Dick Schwartz and Ann Cinco, and then the list of therapists, including Fran Booth, Jean Cantanzaro, Rena Dubin, Marushka Glisson, Suzanne Hoffman, Paul Neustadt, Jessica Reed, Larry Rosenberg, and Martha Sweezy. It takes a village, and we have a number of amazing people continually showing up. So I'd like to introduce Hillary Hodgins now, who will tell us more about the study. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you guys about some of our preliminary results from the study. Um, I'll just say a little bit about who I am. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work at the Trauma Center in Brookline. Um, we do quite a bit of research there on different kinds of trauma interventions. Um, part of our mission is to do research on innovative um, interventions for trauma. Um, and so this sort of all got started as a conversation between our executive director, Joe Spinozola, and Frank. Um, and then they brought me in um, to help think about the research plan and, and how to move forward with this study. Um, and as we had conversations about it, um, it became clear that, that what folks really wanted to do was look at um, effectiveness of IFS with complex trauma. Um, clients and so that's really what we do at the trauma center we work with complex trauma and when I use that terminology what I mean is folks that have um, you know pretty extensive early childhood exposure to different types of trauma especially things like emotional and psychological abuse which tend to fly under the radar I think um, a little bit in the mental health community um, but also neglect physical abuse a range of different things um, and then you know may struggle with a wide variety of different symptoms as adults um, and so that's really what we were focusing on um, with this particular study. Um, I will say for myself, um, it's, I've, I've been honored to be um, involved in this research project, um, to see the amazing work that the therapists have been doing, who've been incredibly generous with their time. Um, thank you. Um, without you guys, we would not be able to do this. Um, so I just wanted to re reiterate that. Um, and so I want to show you guys some of our as Frank said, very preliminary results. Um, when he asked if we could um, show some data from this study, um, the researcher in me you know, felt compelled to say, Frank, we're not gonna be able to do any you know, tests of statistical significance or anything like that by the time the, the conference comes along. But when we started to look at the data, um, it is so compelling that I, I do feel confident in showing you guys some of this information. Um, just to give you a little bit of background um, in terms of, of the, the population that we're working with, these are our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Basically what we're talking about here is a study with adults 
um, who have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So we use a research interview called The CAPS, where we talk with folks about what they've been struggling with over the previous month, um, and also some symptoms of depression. Um, in terms of um, the course of treatment, this is a time-limited course of treatment for this study, so folks are doing 16 sessions of once-weekly IFS for 60 minutes. Um, and we're, we're going for a total of about 15 people that are going to complete in the study, and we're about 75% of the way there at this point. We're going to enroll a few more folks into the study, but we have quite a few people um, that have made it through our different assessments. Um, we bring folks in at, at baseline. Um, we do you know, a bunch of different research measures with you. I'm going to talk about a few of those today. Um, we bring them in halfway through treatment at the end of treatment, and then we do a one-month follow-up. So we're getting four different time points of data um, with, with folks. And again, this is a pilot study, so we don't have a comparison group. We're just looking to see if we can sort of detect a clinical signal um, and get ourselves some data so that we can you know, apply for more funding and, and do more research in the future. So that's the general idea. Um, okay, so now I'm going to show you some pretty graphs. This is the exciting part. Um, so this is our, our CAPS. So this is our primary outcome measure. This is the interview that we do with folks to assess their symptoms of PTSD according to DSM criteria, yay, um, before and after treatment. Um, and so what you can see here is uh, the, the total score on the CAPS at baseline and then post-treatment. So after 16 sessions of IFS, this is only three subjects. but. Um, what you're seeing here is a really dramatic decline in symptoms. Um, so folks are starting out, you know, between 60 and 80 on the CAPS, which is a moderate uh, to high degree of PTSD symptoms. Um, and we're seeing that they go down to below 30. So um, for these particular participants, when they came in after 16 weeks of treatment, they no longer met um, criteria for PTSD. Okay? So that's, that's a really big deal. Um, And it is a testament to the model and to the work that the, the therapists have been doing with these folks. What's interesting, and I want to highlight um, for everybody in the room, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the DSM, whether you want to be or not. Um, <laughs> but, but what we see here, we have it broken down also into the three different clusters of symptoms. So for PTSD, you know, we have avoidance, also hyperarousal, and re-experiencing, which is the intrusive thoughts and nightmares and that kind of stuff. Um, but we're seeing the most dramatic declines for avoidance and hyperarousal, which is very interesting. Um, and so what I will say just anecdotally in, in talking with some of the participants that have been through the treatment, um, some of the things that have been really striking to hear from people is things like, um, you know, normally when, when I would have interactions with my mom, I would try to avoid conversations altogether about anything that happened in the past. And now I'm able to have that conversation and it's still difficult for me, but I can do it and I don't feel like I have to run away from it, right? And that is decreases in avoidance in what it looks like in the day to day. That's so important for people. And so I was so pleased to see that. Um, the hyperarousal piece also, we see that, it, I think this is in parallel with um, you know, that NREP area of body. Um, we see that people are feeling calmer and more comfortable in their own skin um, and, and that kind of stuff. They're not having those, those triggered responses um, uh, as much. And, you know, another thing that I'll, I'll, I'll just share um, from one of our, our participants was that they came in um, at the post and said, you know, I'm kind of worried that, that my data is not really going to reflect how well I'm doing because I've had some triggers come up in the past couple of weeks for me that I've noticed. Um, and despite that, um, still we're seeing this reduction in that folks are saying, I'm better able to manage stress when it comes up for me in my life and things that normally are really difficult for me to deal with is feeling easier for me to overcome that and, and those sorts of things. So that's you know, the, the real world of what, what these lines are telling us, basically. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more measures. Um, this is the DTS, or the Davidson Trauma Scale, which is a self-report of PTSD symptoms. This is our data at the midpoint, and so we have more subjects that have gotten through the midpoint, so I wanted to show that to you all. Um, but then this, which also I found very interesting, um, so this is three time points of data. So we're seeing where people are at baseline, halfway through treatment, and at the end of treatment. And I think what's really notable about this is we're seeing that second half of treatment, those, that second eight weeks, eight, eight weeks eight to 16, is incredibly important um, you know, for people's recovery and healing and symptom reduction, because we're seeing that they're doing well over those first eight weeks, and then there's a real dramatic drop in that second half of treatment. And this is very um, congruent with what the participants have been telling us when they come in for their, for their evaluations. They come in at that midpoint and they say, you know what, I like this treatment, but it's really hard. 
Um, this isn't easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming up for me, so you know, I don't know if you're going to see drops in my measures or not. All our participants are so thoughtful um, and are, are very worried, like you know, about um, what their numbers are going to look like. So, but anyway, they, they look they look great. Um, so, so we see this again dramatic reduction in that that second half of treatment, and I think this this speaks to um, you know that relationship building that happens in the beginning of, of therapy and how important that is to then help people sort of get into the work. Um, and one of the things that that we may learn from this study is that with complex trauma we need a longer course of treatment, but people are doing really well as far as the PTSD symptoms go. And then we also have um, information on their uh, Beck depression inventory. This is another self-report measure that they fill out over four time points, um, and we're seeing that, you know, they're not super duper high on depression at, at baseline, but they've got a moderate moderate level, um, and then they're, they're going down quite dramatically over that second half of treatment as well. So we're seeing some very nice results from our study. We're very excited. We're going to keep collecting data. We'll be back next year where I'll be able to tell you more about what looks significant and all that kind of stuff as far as the fun statistics go. Um, but our preliminary results are very promising. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think another thing that we've heard from the few people that have come in for their follow-up is that they continue to notice um, improvement um, even after the 16 weeks in treatment has come to a close. Some people are continuing, some aren't. Um, so we'll have more to report on that next time, um, but wanted to share with you guys how wonderfully this is going, and um, yeah, very happy to be here. So. As if that's not enough, let me just say we've just got started, and I mean that. Um, so there's um, new exciting projects to support moving forward. Okay, we have two research proposals that have been submitted to the foundation for ongoing research. We're exploring scholarship in marginalized communities. Um, <clears throat> and the advocacy beyond psychotherapy, as we talked about the Pixar event, We have been in contact and communication after the screening event with Pixar. Such a great photo. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to say that we're going to be able to work with them in some fashion. And I would love for Mark Milton, um, the president of Education for Peace and a member of our board, to tell you a couple minutes about this new potential exciting project that we're involved in. So Mark, would you please come up? Um, when I imagine that two years ago, we were talking, just started talking about uh, IFS, self-leadership, uh, beyond psychotherapy, and we see what's happening in two years, just imagine what's going to be happening in two more years. And it's true that uh, two years ago, little did we know that the most um, um, important, probably, um, company in the world doing um, uh, illustrations was preparing something around parts. Um, just to let you know, before, we'd like to share with you, the foundation, um, that you have an idea of what we're working on with Pixar. But just before, let me tell you a couple of words about what Education for Peace is doing in Europe so you get the, the idea. Um, we are actually, we've been working for 15 years now to bring self-awareness and education for the new generation. Self-awareness in the, in the global vision of self-awareness through different means. And of course, uh, the IFS model is a perfect uh, view of how to bring this. And we've been working for many years now in sports. And we've had three national sports federations in Europe who have embraced self-awareness as a core skill in the sports now uh, on a national level, which is quite huge. You imagine that millions of children are going to be learning now about self-awareness, not just technical, tactical uh, stuff. And uh, the Pixar event is just such a huge opportunity. And um, I'd like to share with you, with, the, with an IFS way, what we're going to be doing. When I say an IFS way, go inside. And just imagine um, your most favorite sports uh, person, a famous sports person that you have admiration for, 
and you imagine this person uh, suddenly in uh, the, their sports having a, we could say a misbehavior. Suddenly they lost it. And they had a behavior where, well, there we are, it happens. And what happens then is that uh, our little Pixar friends go in their head. And you suddenly hear uh, anger saying, what happened? You hear fear saying, but why did you do this? You're crazy. Millions of people are watching us on TV, etc." And um, you see afterwards that time goes by and your sports fan is actually then looking at the parts with the Pixar um, faces and closes his or her eyes and with self-led voice talks to the parts and explains with time what they've learned together. That's the scenario which we've been working on. We have already some very top famous sports people ready to do this with us. And the amazing news for us uh, is with Frank, when we spoke with uh, one of the most senior persons in Pixar, they said that they love this, they're touched by it. We, we imagine that they are seeing that this can go uh, up to an educational level for, for them. So this is what we're working on uh, with, uh, with Pixar. So we hope to have a lot of great stuff to tell you in one year, or maybe show you even better. Thank you. Um, I love IFS, and I love this foundation. And the foundation is here to help secure and support the future of IFS. Thank you very much.